من مهدی It was his assistance and contribution that's always backing us and pushing us forward. And may God bestow his uh, blessings uh, to the pure soul of the late Imam Khomeini who has opened up this way. And that's the end of the speech. Live coverage of uh, the speech made by leader of the Islamic Revolution, Ayatollah Sayyid Ali Khamenei, on the occasion of an uprising that happened on such a day in 1978 before the Iranian Revolution that came to fruition uh, about a month later than that anniversary in 1979. Of course, the leader spoke on the importance of uh, that day and how it evolved into a movement that engulfed the whole country when it started from the holy city of Qom that is near to the Iranian capital Tehran, mainly known for its uh, religious senior uh, seniority as well as the center of religious scholars and schools and then how it spread to the other Iranian cities which later on of course uh, led to the Iranian 1979 revolution. Of course, the leader making that speech also spoke about some other issues of international importance, uh, including uh, the JCPOA, that's the Iranian nuclear deal that was signed by Iran and uh, some of the world powers in 2015, which uh, later on in 2018 saw one of the sides, that is the United States of America, leaving it, which the leader, by the way, said was an act of treason because later on it led to some sanctions that were leveled against the Iranian nation, which he, by the way, termed as treason and unjust and some things that have to be lifted uh, regardless of the fact that any sort of connection will be or will not be established between the two countries diplomatically. He uh, spoke about uh, the importance of the city of Rome. He also spoke uh, more importantly, before I forget, um, that because we are pretty close to the anniversary, it was just a few days uh, back uh, when we had the anniversary of the martyrdom of uh, some of the most renowned men in Iran in the past two decades. That's uh, Lieutenant General Qasem Soleimani, who was unfortunately assassinated uh, in a drone attack that happened uh, near the Baghdad uh, airport, the Iraqi capital, of course, which uh, um, obviously led to his martyrdom, not only him, but uh, one of his close associates within the rank of the Ira uh, Iraqi resistance by the name of Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis. Unfortunately, uh, after that incident, it led to waves of uh, popular moves, uh, which, by the way, the, again, the leader said uh, could not have been brought about uh, if that had to come through any kind of order, and he said that was totally popular, and that shows what kind of a place and elevation people like Qasem uh, Soleimani hold in people's hearts and eyes. He also uh, expressed regrets uh, on the anniversary of the shooting down of a Ukrainian plane that happened about three or four nights after the martyrdom of General Soleimani. Um, uh, that happened near the Iranian capital's airport, which unfortunately led to the death of uh, uh, some 176 passengers, uh, an unforgettable and immeasurably sad event, and I'm pretty sure, in the history of Iran. Uh, he also talked about the U.S. sanctions against the country, which, as, as I mentioned, uh, first he referred to by the term treason and the fact that uh, um, they should be lifted. Regarding the Iranian economy, economy and how independently from the sanctions it has to work, he said, uh, that the Iranian economy has the possibility of flourishing without referring, without really um, needing for the sanctions to basically being lifted and the fact that uh, um, the Iranian economy has the power to flourish without it. But even but if the sanctions are to be lifted, it's a lot better for the whole nation. Uh, he said that we have to uh, lead our economy in such a way that it can, as I mentioned, flourish 
without the possibility of sanctions even being removed, and he said that it is totally possible to do so. The leader also talked about the JCPOA, uh, that's uh, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. For those of you who are not familiar with the term, that was the a deal that I mentioned earlier that Iran signed uh, based on which uh, Iran limited some of its peaceful nuclear activities in exchange for some of the international as well as unilateral sanctions to be lifted, according to which uh, they had to come to effect uh, as soon as uh, some of the bodies within the country of Iran and those five other countries ratified it, which unfortunately met some hurdles back then in the U.S., and uh, even more unfortunately, it was met by the change of the establishment of, of the government, I'm sorry, in the United States, led by President Trump, which brought about uh, the exit of America back in 2018, which again, right then followed by some of uh, uh, the most uh, unilateral, cruel, and uh, sanctions that, according to the Americans, had not been leveled against any country. Uh, he also talked about the issue of these days that uh, mm, is quite talked about in, in all countries, and that's uh, the coronavirus, uh, and more importantly, the production of a vaccine for treatment of the coronavirus. He said that he personally does not trust the vaccine that comes from the countries the UK, France, and the United States of America, uh, if the government uh, is in strives to try to purchase and procure a vaccine from some other countries other than these three, he uh, does not have any opposition to that, but from these three countries, he expressed that he uh, does not have trust in them. And uh, regarding uh, the possibility, which, mind you, is a great possibility of Iran coming uh, to producing its own vaccine of the coronavirus, he said it's a great possibility. It's a source of national pride for all Iranians if this happens, and he expressed hope that that will happen soon. Again, what you were watching up to now for the past hour was a live speech by Iran's leader, Ayatollah Sayyid Ali Khamenei, uh, on uh, the occasion of an uprising on such a day as today in 1978, which, as I mentioned, led to the Iranian revolution a year later, which the leader, by the way, said uh, was mainly thanks to the religious leadership of the time. It has just passed noontime. Oh, uh, Sameh, to see you, like always. Um, which part of the leader's speech interested you more? Try to uh, delineate a little bit on uh, that speech. Good morning. Uh, you know, I think this was a historic speech. This was a, a speech, it, it, it wasn't like the other speeches. Mm. Uh, he really mentioned the most important key points domestically, regionally, globally. And he said it in a tone and he said it in a way that basically uh, puts an end to a lot of these discussions. Uh, if you think about some, some of the discussions that are happening domestically or some of the issues that are being discussed in the Western media or, or in media outside of Iran in terms of some of the issues of Iran, he really, you know, mentioned the main points and he said it in a way that uh, clarified and puts to rest a lot of the discussions. I think uh, one of the things that was interesting for me is that the way he talked about America being an idol and that idol... Uh, being a false god, being something that people worship. What do you do with idols? You, you worship them uh, based on, you know, n nothing related to rational or, or anything that's, that's, that's real, which is the difference between real religions and, and fake religions and cults. And so he talked about this idol of America, you know, falling apart. And it's interesting. He also added, he said, it's, it's wondrous, it's strange how some people still cling to this. Uh, for hope or use America as their example. You know, we have people in Iran who still do that and we have people other places who still do that. And he re referred, of course, to the uh, all of it, to, to Corona, to, to the elections, to, you know, what happened in the in the last couple of days in the U.S. So this, I think, was very important uh, for, for a lot of people to hear, both in Iran and outside of Iran. Uh, the other thing that he talked about, which is very important, and you also mentioned it in your comments, which is that all of U.S policy in the region is based on destabilization. It's not simply 
that the U.S. wants the region to be unstable. It actively destabilizes the region. And it does it by supporting dictators on a political level. It does it by uh, supporting oligarchic economic systems where money and wealth is in the hands of the few and the people have no role in the economy. And it supports it most importantly, and this starts with the British and the Americans as the inheritor of the British, of the British Empire. It, it does so by creating unviable states, states that cannot survive on their own and are completely dependent on foreign powers. In this case, the Americans and before them, the British. So you, if you look at the map of, the, of, of West Asia, you see little countries that have no independent capability of surviving. And so they become vassals of the U.S. And you see all the things that happen. And unfortunately, we spend time in the media, in academia, speaking about these countries, as he said as the leader himself said, I'm not going to mention names. Uh, so I'm not going to mention names either now, maybe. But you, we spend time discussing these countries and the acts of the leaders of these countries as, as if they're really countries. They're not real countries. Mm. They're, they're, they, are, they are sovereign and territorial mendacities that have been given a flag by the retreating British and by the Americans that have been given legal status in the international system. But they have no peoples. Uh, they are basically family-run dictatorships uh, that passes from brother to brother or from brother from father to son or to uncle to nephew. I like and, that. You know, I like that, Mehdi. This is, this, is, this, is the, this is the reality of it. And, and we, we talk about them as though they're real things. Compared to that, you have a, a real country like Iran with, with a real history, with real people, with, with a real system of, of governance that's based on a revolution and... Of course, the occasion of, of uh, the leader's speech was the 19th of day, which was the uprising in Qom, here in the city of Qom, where I am today, which was the spark that began the revolution in Iran. And what was the revolution in Iran? It was the Iranian people deciding that they're going to overthrow an absolute monarchy that was completely dependent, corrupt. These are all the things that he mentioned in the speech. For those who saw it, it's repetitive, but for those who didn't see it, they have to know that what existed in Iran was a completely corrupt, dependent, uh, uh, you know, oligarchic uh, dictatorship in the mm -hmm. hands of one person who, who knows how he became. He, he became the king, he became the ruler of this mm -hmm. ancient land because his father was the, was the king. And so what happened in Iran and what happened in Qom and then which led to the revolution was that the Iranian people decided they're going to have a system of governance in which they themselves make the, make the main decisions. Mm -hmm. They themselves get to vote for uh, uh, the legislative branch. They get to vote for the executive branch. And all of this within the religion that is their religion, which is Islam. So, you know, there's this false narrative that somehow Islam is against, you know, democracy or is, Islam is against people having a popular government. That's absolutely not the case. Mm -hmm. What it is, is we have a system in which the, the limits of what humans can do is set by Sharia. And Sharia in, in Shia Islam is determined by living mujtahids. These are technical terms, but people should know them. It's very important. Mm -hmm. What we have in Shia Islam is a system in which the laws are reviewed by living scholars. So that's why you see, for example, he mentioned some of the technologies that Iran has made advancements in, including nanotechnology and, and, and cellular stem cells, which Iran is a, is a global leader in cellular stem cells. Mm -hmm. And that goes back to the fact that our scholars can determine that these things are not against uh, Sharia or not against uh, divine law, which is the goal is to, to live according to, to divine law. And so they are able to enter into technologies. And we see Iran in the last 40 years becoming a, a global leader in many technologies because we don't have that kind of irrational uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, superstitious way of looking at religion. It's a, it's a rational religion, you know. And it allows us to advance. And what has happened in Iran in the last 40 years is something that's remarkable in history. Mm. We have never seen a, a case in the world where you had a country going from what it was 40, 50 years ago to what it is today. He also talked about, you know, uh, media control, which I think is a very important point. Mm -hmm. He talked about that a, a big part of what intelligence and security services do in the world is control how history, how events, how the media reports on events. And they try to distort it, spin it in a way that is to their advantage. And we, we need to look no further than what is happening in the US. You have, uh, you know, big tech, Twitter, Facebook, all these big, huge monopolies. And by the way, this is not some sort of a, you know, 
when I say they're monopolies, this was determined by a congressional pan by a congressional committee when they did research and they wanted to investigate whether uh, these big tech companies, all those uh, names that that I mentioned and others, whether they fit the definition of a monopoly, which is against the law in the U.S., they concluded that they do. Mm. And so what we have is you have, of course, for Press TV and for Iranians, you know, whenever somebody was posting something, for example, about uh, Hajj Qasim, General Soleimani, of course, we all got banned and we all got kicked out or we mm -hmm. got, you know, temporarily, you know, got removed, whatever post it was. Very, yeah, It could have been right. a very innocent, simple thing. Right. So this is nothing new for Iranians. But it's interesting to see that they're doing it to their own president. They're yeah. doing it to, <laughs> to people. You know, I mean, let's not uh, get very excited about some of the things we hear in Western media. 70 million people plus voted for Trump. So this is a significant portion of the American population. Mm -hmm. Let's assume, you know, half of them are diehard Trump supporters. Mm -hmm. That's still 35, 40 million people. And you see what's happening in the U.S. is they're being completely erased off the media. They don't allow them to talk in the, in the, in the mainstream network media. They're being erased off the big tech social media platforms and the whole narrative is being sp spun in a way that's to the advantage of the ruling elites and the ruling oligarchy so sure. this was something very important that he talked about of course and the same with history there yeah. were other things that Nancy, he before about. you continue i'm pretty sure, sure that you and i could go on uh, and you know do this uh, as long as you like, but unfortunately, I have prepared some other news stories uh, for people this hour. If you allow me, we'll talk about this. We'll pick this up or some other issues perhaps uh, at some other time. For now, let me just thank you for the time you gave me and Press TV Mehti, Sam Mehti Torabi, the director with Resolat Strategic Studies Institute at the city of Oklahoma. It's always a pleasure. You know that, Mehti. Thank you. The U.S. president has announced that he is now focusing on a peaceful transition of power a day after Congress certified Joe Biden's victory in the 2020 presidential election. I continue to strongly believe that we must reform our election laws to verify the identity and eligibility of all voters and to ensure faith and confidence in all future countries uh, to, 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 to help fix the situation as the Iranian vaccine enters the market. But ultimately, since Iran's production will be indigenous, Iran will be able to immune society far more swiftly than any other country in this region. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, Sam Mahdi, another thing that I'd like to discuss with you is uh, t t totally and directly has to do with these uh, few things that are happening in our region. Look, we have the increase of the number of B-52s. We have a U.S. Uh, capital that was under attack yesterday. You know, we have some developments that are happening within the U.S. and what the U.S. is doing within our region. And a President Trump, a lame duck president that is uh, going to leave office in some 13 days and the fear that some of the U.S. senators even have uh, that he might start a war with Iran, it's a quite... It, mm, a very sensitive time, if I may say so. Uh, why do you think the leader, do you, do you, first of all, do you think there was a significance of the, for the timing that the leader chose for that speech? And if there is, please tell us what that is. Sure. As, as we talked about initially today, mm -hmm. uh, I think that this speech today by the leader was a historic speech. It wasn't like other speeches. Mm -hmm. It was, it was uh, very direct and without any sort of trying to uh, say things indirectly. It directly mentioned many important issues, and it w had a large scope in terms of the topics that it sure. covered. And uh, the tone of it was a tone in which he basically was saying to audiences, both domestic and international, that certain things have been decided, or th certain things are now no longer, it's no longer necessary to debate certain things because the decisions have been made. So in terms of the defense capability, he mentioned three things. He mentioned the sanctions, he, he, he mentioned the regional presence and he mentioned defense capabilities as being things that are not negotiable and things that, uh, that there's not going to be any sort of budging on the Iranian side, things that, of course, Dr. Mandy also referred to. Mm -hmm. In terms of the defense, because that's the first thing you, <clears throat> you asked about, well, there's a thing called strategic deterrence, which means that you have defense capabilities and the leader specifically spelled it out. He says these de uh, defense capabilities, this strategic deterrence, changes the calculations of the enemy. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So if the enemy is sitting there thinking that they can do this or they can do that with Iran, when you have defensive capabilities, that calculation changes. And this has been the point of many people, of many of us in Iran who have been talking about this for years. And unfortunately, uh, depending on whatever administration or whatever uh, part of the elite in Iran is in power, we you know, have this sometimes go, being pushed along and sometimes there's some delays in it. The fact is that whenever you want to negotiate with anybody, whether it's America, the West, China, Russia, I'm mentioning all these so that nobody thinks I'm picking on one <laughs> part of the world, yeah. uh, you have to have defensive capabilities. You have to have strategic deterrence. Then you sit down and you discuss things. Uh, I mentioned this in, in, in a bunch of the debates on Press TV before. There was a strategic decision, decision about 20, 30 years ago by the Iranian elites that they're going to try to normalize economic relations with the West in exchange for uh, compromising on certain matters of strategic capabilities. This was something, as Dr. Mirandi also referred to, in a world of the late 80s, early 90s, mid 90s, a world which is very different than the world today. Mm -hmm. It was a world in which maybe Iran at that time, in the thinking of certain elites in Iran, didn't have really any other choices if it wanted to allow its, if it wanted to grow its economy, especially after the, the war and the area, era of rebuilding. Well, we went through this process for 20 years, almost 30 years. This process did not lead to a normalization of economic relations. And the reason it didn't is not because Iran didn't compromise, as we saw with the JCPOA and all of the things that the leader referred to in his speech today in terms of the things that Iran has done. It didn't reach normalization because the West could not normalize it. The Americans could not normalize, and the Europeans, because they don't have an independent decision-making process, because they are vassals of the U.S., uh, after World War II, and they don't have their own strategic vision, the Europeans couldn't normalize it. So my point is this. As much as this talk about, well, if the Americans do this, if the Americans do that, then we will do this, we will do that. This is, I think, just, you know, diplomatic or sort of a psychological, uh, in terms of keeping the diplomatic uh, path open. But the reality is that the Americans and the Europeans won't fulfill their obligations in the next couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. before the law is, is fully implemented in Iran. So we have to now move on from this 20-year process and, and declare that this was a historic defeat for the West. It had a chance to do this. It didn't do it. We have to declare to those elites in Iran, which, you know, again, the leader was referring to certain people. He, he, he talked about the U.S. being an idol, being this idol breaking up. Certain people, it's strange, it's wondrous that some people still follow the Americans or are still waiting for the Americans to do something. Mm -hmm. And uh, by extension, the West. You also mentioned that. Mm -hmm. So we have to declare to those in, elites in Iran that it's time to move on from this 20-year process. There will not be a normalization of economic relations with the West. They need to move on. We, we're starting to have good relations with China, with Russia, with the BRICS countries. Mm -hmm. And this is the path forward for Iran in terms of its international economic relations. And most importantly, most importantly, as was mentioned, Iran is not the country that it was 30 years ago. It has developed immense capabilities compared to what it was 20, 30 years ago. It is, it's, it is a producer in its own right about, uh, in, in many, of, many, many things. And if you compare the Iranian population uh, roughly 85 million, and compare that to the level of its GDP and the size of its GDP, you will see that Iran is actually a, a, a big economic power in the world. Mm -hmm. We're not even mm -hmm. talking about the oil and, and, and Iran as, a, as yeah, an energy yeah, superpower I know, I know. Yeah, 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 and yeah. the gas. So the point is this. Today, the leader very clearly said that there are things being mentioned in the media by elites in academia, which we no longer need to be discussing. He, 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 he said it directly. These three things, sanctions, Iran's presence in the region, and defense capabilities, which right. I referred to. Right. And presence in the region, let's just, let's just say it very bluntly and clearly. It's ridiculous for anybody outside of the region to be discussing Iran's regional presence. Right. This is Iran's region. There's, right. it, it, it's nobody's business if Iran wants to take care of its neighborhood. As the leader pointed out very clearly, this is a very important point, he said that the whole goal of the Americans and the West is destabilization. It's not simply that the region be unstable. Mm -hmm. It's active destabilization. And it's Iran that is the force for stability in the mm -hmm. region. Mm -hmm. When Iran enters the, the scene, as it entered the scene after the U.S. invasion of Iraq, 
uh, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Yemen. It is actually Iran's presence that brings stability. Sure. And I'm going to now add another sentence, which I know certain people in Iran don't like. But it is only through Iran being, taking its place as the natural hegemon of the region, mm -hmm. that we will have stability, prosperity, economic welfare in the region. As long as there is the American presence as the hegemon, mm -hmm. as long as there is infighting and sure. fighting among the states, there is going to be economic depravity in the region. Sure. The only power that can guarantee stability in the region is Iran as the mm -hmm. natural hegemon mm -hmm. of the region. Mm -hmm. Understandably so. Uh, thank you, Sam Mahdi. I have about a minute to close this show. Uh, Dr. Marandi, your final thoughts, please. Well, Iran doesn't aspire to be a regional hegemon. Iran is a strong and independent country, and but it does, but it does wish to protect its friends and allies in this region. It will not allow ISIS, Al-Qaeda, or the Israeli regime to dominate the region, and weak regimes like Saudi Arabia and, and others across the region. Mm -hmm. They have to recognize that plotting against Iran and, and its allies will come at a very heavy price. Price. And if the United States makes the grave mistake of attacking Iran during the next two weeks, mm -hmm. Iran will make sure everything in this region is destroyed. Mm -hmm. The United Arab Emirates will be destroyed. And the other countries that have American bases and facilitate any U.S. strike on Iran, however limited, will be destroyed. The infrastructure will be destroyed. Those countries will cease to exist. They are puny countries and even Saudi Arabia, which is completely reliant on oil mm -hmm. and its assets in the Persian sure. Gulf and alongside its shores, it will not survive. Yes, Doctor, some uh, very emphatic uh, uh, comments by uh, Dr. Marandi there. That's uh, Syed Mohammad Marandi, university professor and political analyst out of Tehran. It's always a pleasure, Doctor, to speak to, uh, to you and uh, Sam Mahdi Torabi, director with Risalat uh, Strategic Studies Institute out of the city of Qom. I'm glad you could join us back, Mahdi. Thank you, gentlemen. And